Ding dong. <laughs> Welcome to this episode of the Justice Team podcast on the Justice Team Network. And today we have the pleasure of having our favorite Irish barrister on, Ronan Duggan. Thank you so much, Bob. I tell you what, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not quite bourbon approved territory yet. <laughs> you know what? If you get your drinking skills on, I know we meet a lot of 317s across the calendar year. If you keep it up, you might be able to get on. I must say, on behalf of my countrymen, we don't know anything about this drink you talk <laughs> of. Not, By the way, aware. it's St. Paddy's Day, not St. Paddy's Day. Yeah, St. Patrick's or Paddy's. St. Patty is your auntie from Wisconsin <laughs> or Columbus, Ohio. We don't know her. P A D D Y. It's uh, yeah. So. Ronan, he does not like that. So we are very, our steam guest today has been part of trials where they're getting eight, nine figure verdicts on cases that are single event, auto crashes, motorcycle crashes, and the decedent or the person that was driving the motorcycle is on meth. Yes. There are terrible facts and those facts are coming in from the jury that, and you guys are still achieving these results. Yes, it's important I point out at this stage that my wingman in those operations is Arish Amanpour, mm -hmm. who's maybe one of the most accomplished trial attorneys has ever done it. So I am a very, very sexy bridesmaid at best. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it's it's been a wondrous uh, section of my career working with this guy. And yes, we have we seem to be we seem to have a niche now in cases involving people who have been on drugs and have various qualities of life, etc. And it's kind of perfect insofar as Mr. Hammondport loves to go to trial. And those are the kind of trials that defense people feel, oh, they're just worthless. You know, this person mm -hmm. had a, a drug problem, this person was homeless, this person had X, Y, and Z. And it gives you an opportunity to really go and do some avant-garde trial practice. And I get to sit there in the back like a dancer in the Backstreet Boys. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. No, but, um, <laughs> no, it's been great. I want to just say before we carry on, this man here is the reason why I became a plaintiff's lawyer. I was one of those miserable shithead defense attorneys. No disrespect to them. They're often lovely people. And it was Bob Simon who got me into into this style of law. Yeah, so I have start, to thank you live. To you the know masses. what's you know what you know. I actually remember the first time we met in person. But Ronan first met because he was sliding into my DMs with a burner account trolling me, and I, it actually did work. And then we started talking about Dungeons and Dragons, and other things. We ran a campaign actually almost three years ago to this. No. Yeah. Four years, because it was 2020. It was right before COVID. We did our first campaign, Dungeons and Dragon World Ravel. Uh, we had our little notebooks that had our face on it. We rolled our characters. We did some dungeon crawling for the better part of the next year and a half. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> and what I remember was, I thought it was a wind-up. I thought he, he might have been winding me up initially. And he's like, well, we're putting together this game. And I said, you better not, this better not be a wind-up. Oh, I'm going man. into the situation. And it wasn't. And it became like more and more like, what's actually happening here? This is weird. And I showed up at a house that I didn't know was Brad's house. Oh, my brother. And I'm sat out there and I'm like, there's no one here. I'm going to get I'm going to get jumped by a bunch of burly Manhattan <laughs> beaters. <laughs> and then Greg Shaver pulled up behind me and said, OK, OK, he could be a hitman. He may not be. And, and I said, OK, it started to calm down then. And we went in and we sure enough, we played the game. And it was some of the happiest, some of the happiest, I, 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 oh, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a gaming connoisseur. Yeah, you know, I know. You know that. We were talking before the episode about, you know, Ronan's getting into some Warham gaming, Warhammer gaming with um, some very esteemed, well, the guy played Superman. Yeah, guys. maybe, maybe we'll see. <laughs> but I tell you, no, I, 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 I've been into all that since I was a kid. So it was great to find attorneys here that didn't go, you, you do like, I say it to some people, I go, what, what the hell's wrong with you? And I say, yeah. well, I don't golf and I don't that and I play with little toy soldiers because my life is dope and I do dope shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, it was, but it's building so a tribe. So, you it know, was, during COVID, we had our, you know, our group that still got together virtually to be able to do these things and it was like, you know, it was awesome. So, um, you know, we, I don't think any of us were on meth though. A lot of your clients were during those sessions. I mean, maybe <laughs> somebody was. We had some very, you know, very articulate mages that got up into very weird shit. Yeah, it was great. What I really loved was, and I tended to do this, and they should remain nameless for this, but we would take well-known attorneys in our community and they would become cameo characters. Yes. The Drowleys. Yeah, that was, <laughs> sorry, that was good. The great Sorry, wolf. Nick. You were, you, were, you were an arch nemesis in there, but that's only because you're so good. It was, and we, we, did, we did a bit of that, didn't we? It was good. It was fun. And uh, I still, that was some of the, that was the best campaign we ever did. Best campaign. And uh, do you remember some of the final battles? Sometimes when you play these games, they just, a, a dice can destroy the epicness of it. But we got lucky, didn't we? Yes, we did. They turn into these incredible. I remember when you games. rolled a natural, well, we could do 100s instead of 20s for right. some, or something crazy that happened on that, uh, 
one of those hotels or we were on a boat. I don't remember. Anyway. So we're lawyers, Bob. We're lawyers. <laughs> we're lawyers. Let's back, get back, back to it. Let's get back to practical advice for lawyers. So um, their firm has got the, the biggest results, I mean, in trial probably in the past three years. And these are cases that most lawyers would say no to. In fact, most lawyers did say no to yep. these cases. They were turned down. Yep. They were like, this person's 100% at fault, et cetera. So walk us through kind of the first one. What were the big issues okay. and how did you deal with them? Okay. So the first one we had, and I, I'll tell the ending before I start the start. I like as this. As my grandfather used to say. It actually, we won. It was a very, very hard fought thing. A, a really a clean as a victory as you can get. And we had an unfortunate judge who decided to order a, a retrial. And that's now, the, we're in appeal world on that. So that somewhat took the sting yeah, out. Yeah, and that, yeah. That, tra- that judge is one of the worst judges, and now he's off the bench. The, she, I'm telling you what. Mm-hmm. It, it was unbelievable. Now, I've practiced in two countries, and I've never seen anything like it. This particular mm-hmm. judge really, really just has a, an inbuilt bias against what He'll do everything you can do. to try to make you lose. So we were up against it from day one, and we knew that he was going to try and do that. So we were running a very clean trial. So anyway, Andrade was a case where a young gentleman... I think he was in his 20s. I I may screw up some of the basic facts, but he was on a motorcycle heading to work one morning and a truck going on a delivery pulled out in front of him and he basically braked and banged into the truck and died, right? And there was a lot of complex, leaving aside the issues of of, of he as a person and all that and the, the, the stuff about damages, it was a complex scientific case because... We had two accident reconstruction experts who were diametrically opposed, very far apart. And what we had to do was we had to engage in very expensive FEM analysis. So what happens is... What's FEM? Yeah, finite element material analysis is what it is. If, I'm, if, if there's any engineers listening, I got it wrong. I don't care. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> so what happens is normally when crashes happen, they analyze certain markers on the road that can detect speed and they they analyze the the weights involved and the crushes that happen and they input those into various formulae and it pumps out what the speed of the traveling vehicle was say that hits in this case the motorcycle and between the two uh, accident recon there's something like a 30 or 20 mile an hour difference and I was like, and I said myself in a rational, like, how is it so far apart? Obviously, our- yeah, usually when you have the accident reconstructionists for both sides, they're not too much different because it's, it's science. It's exactly. Yeah. So what we ended up doing was he basically, our expert, Steve Anderson, who's absolutely brilliant. Oh, yeah. If, he's a motorcycle guy. If you have a motorcycle yeah. case, he is the man. He and I must have spent hours just, he's, he's so generous with his time explaining the science and you, you, he gives you a real education anyway he's and he's a brilliant, brilliant he's, with, he's, still, he's with the mea forensic yes that, yeah mea forensic in, i'm uh, telling you laguna if you're out Miguel. there you have a motorcycle case do the investment don't 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 try to save on it get him he's amazing anyway so what happened was i said to him how do you definitively demonstrate this shit without what, what's the what's the gold standard he says well the gold standard is we buy a fleet of vehicles and smash them together <laughs> right and that would cost millions but the next thing down is finite element analysis. So when car companies or vehicle companies are making uh, new vehicles, they don't build hundreds of prototypes. They have these extremely detailed computer models where every element that goes into Mm. the car, whether it be the metal, the plastic, the rubber, whatever, the characteristics of it are perfectly mapped digitally, right? Are these the manufacturers? The manufacturers. Okay. Now, in this particular case, we got very lucky because the truck involved in the case had a model that was very, very close in the public domain. Mm. So we could get that model and run our own crash analysis with this. And sure enough, all that does is you put in the elements, you get the truck, you build an approximation of the motorcycle and you crash it. And then you can map that and show that specifically what happens versus what happened by going if we run it at 30 miles an hour, it'll be this deep. If we run yeah. it at 60 miles an hour, this deep. So if you're going as fast as the right. other side says, you're going to be, the body's going to fly yeah. way further. Exactly. Yeah. Now this, so what happened was, the, back up for a second, Steve said to me, he said, look, Ronan, I've seen these crashes day in, day out for years. And I'm telling you, that car was not doing, say, 60 or 70 or 80 when it hit. It was a much lower speed because the whole truck would be basically crushed completely in. So with the model analysis, we showed it. And it was so devastating to them. It, it really, who knows how they're going to pivot if this thing, pivot, if this goes to another trial. But the science was clear. I mean, it seems like, you know, when we try these cases and they're disputing liability, if you spend enough time in analysis, I know you guys are hyper, like, focused on yeah. detail. 
you could really put so many holes that'll piss off the jury. Well, what happened was a rash crossed him in trial, uh, naturally enough. And uh, it was just a machine gun. And like he, he got a proper walloping. <laughs> and we were, he, it came to a point where the jury just, we, we, we just felt that they understood the science about halfway through that, maybe even before. The other aspects of it, so, okay, when you have one of these cases, there's all these things that at first blush look like they're terrible. We, two, we had two eyewitnesses saying he was speeding. We had the toxicology. We had this, we had that. We had this expert saying this. And each one of those things, I think, can often send us away as, as mm -hmm. people who may get involved in the case. And in fairness to Arash, because he's done so much of it and, he's, and he has a scientific mind, he starts to break those things down. So the, the witnesses, we completely demolish them. And the, the cre I tell you what, I've seen a lot of fancy, intricate cross-examination in my career. Arash has all of those skills. I'm not big up, and I'm like, I already have the job, by the way. Like, I'm not doing an interview here. <laughs> but uh, he, he gets up and he gets a feeling, and some trial lawyers have this, and maybe people can learn it, but he just, had a, he just gets good feelings about people just are going to collapse. Mm -hmm. And he literally said, he asked two questions of this witness who was their key witness in terms of he was speeding. He goes, and he basically said, that's not true, right? <laughs> and she completely collapsed. <laughs> now, if you see that on paper, like, what did this dude do? He just asked, that's not true. Whatever it was, it was a very simple question, but he had a feeling and he sat right on her emotionally and she just caved in. And then as they tried to pull her back and it just didn't work. So he, he has that instinct to collapse people and that can happen certainly with experts. And that's something that a lot of us, mm -hmm. we go in with fancy schematics to deconstruct the brain. But you get a feeling and you chase it. You got to go. go with it. You know, you times, go, right, you know I've, been, I've been in trial and one of my... Um, good friends grace and goodies here you know, outside the recording studio at the deposition and i remember i had this one witness on the stand and like yeah, i had that feeling and i took a chance and it fucking worked and grace knew afterward he i could see the way he stirred like stark white and he goes off and he was like dude that was fucking risky he's like that was a huge risk and yeah but you feel like you know whenever you have somebody you know what i'm saying like if yeah, you know, I yeah you, you got that gut feeling and i mean i've never now had it not work but it's yeah i think it's like the upper level yeah, uh, he's right. I think what happens is I learn by writing. So I often write outlines. But if I carry them to the lectern to do a witness or two or three, if I'm allowed, I abandon it. You must. Yeah. Because what happens is you create an algorithm that starts to affect you in your questioning. And if you don't abandon your programming when they go off and do mm -hmm. something you're not expecting, you'll start to collapse a bit and the jury will sense it. So keep it open, keep it open. Barnstein, the judge, was a very difficult judge to, to question with because he was constantly egging on the defense to, to object. He's making his own objections, trying and to get doing, his doing, It's crazy. And you know when you start, sometimes the judge will put you in a foundation hole, I call it. And he kept doing that in a series of questions to me. And I felt like saying, I felt like, okay, let's start from the beginning of time. Are you on planet Earth? <laughs> Let's lay that foundation. Are you a human yeah, being? And, and for those that are, like it was, oh, and for those that are listening, when this says lay foundation, usually the judge's cue card to you is like take a step back, and then it's reframed to make sure we understand the sandbox that you're playing in. But a lot of times, judges that are control freaks or rooting against you keep just using that to try to yeah right to to, to throw you off. And it's a lot of law lawyers if they stick to that script, they can't. They I can't understand when that happens. It throws them off completely. They, Look, they, I, I do yeah. it to defense lawyers do yeah. objection and foundation, and if it gets sustained, they're so off their game they don't know how to backpedal. Yeah, it out. you collapse psychologically because you. It, so what I do is I lean into the. Arash wouldn't agree with this. He's that's not his style. But we all have our own styles. I would kind of self-deprecate to some degree, and I kind of turn to the jury and kind of do a bit of this. <laughs> but honestly, he was putting me in such a foundation hole on some of these, and this was a basic witness. This was one of the family members. And I kind of then just backed out and gone, and I backed right out. So it, it became kind of, it, it put the onus back on the judge to stop being a, a prick. Well, with, but the right? jury feels it too. Yeah, they feel it. Yeah, the jury's like, come on, judge. Like, we know, like, they're going to answer the question eventually. So why do we do yeah, this right. for your morale? So I kind of, you, you you turn it into an entertaining experience for the jury. They get a little education what's going on. But a lot of young lawyers who go to trial get stuck in that moment and they start to panic and then they go to a new, they, they shift away from an important section and they go to a new set of questions. Don't, calm down, let the jury know you're trying to deal with a problem and then back out to the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, even on the basic math, we destroyed them. But then we took it to the next level with this analysis. Again, not every firm out there, sorry, 
not every defense situation, or sorry, not every case you have, you'll actually have access to that wireframe model, the FEM model in the public domain. I suppose you could theoretically go build one, but that probably costs a million bucks or something. But we got lucky in that. And, and those are the things where we got lucky because we start asking the bloody right questions mm -hmm. about where we go to definitively prove this. If an expert is saying, look, I'm telling you, Ronan, I've done this for 30 odd years. I know this is not the speed. There's got to be something to get you there. So when you deal with your experts, again, I think what happens often, Bob, is people are reluctant to have, I, I'm, I do a Columbo routine. I don't know. Columbo. Anything. Peter you know I mean? Falk. Yeah, I know yeah, Columbo. But I don't, I don't know the answers to these things. I'm not a fancy pants. There's yeah. some fancy pants out there not willing to admit. I go to the experts and go, I'm a child. You educate me about this subject. Well, that's what you should do. You should lean on your experts to educate you because you have to do the same thing to a jury later, yeah, like a child. Yeah, people don't lean into their experts or ask them the right questions because yeah. there's a they have a wealth of information and things that they can open up to you. But a lot of lawyers get lazy. They just take what the case is given to them, et cetera. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, well, I tell you, even when I started with you, Lop, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about uh, the kind of cases you did, the mm -hmm. spinal stuff and all that. And and I start going, okay, I start asking basic questions. I remember when an early day I was in the Hermosa office and Sebi was there. And I asked him a basic propositional question about how you deal with mm -hmm. past meds or whatever, whatever the hell it was. Mm -hmm. And he gave me an answer, and I was like, I don't understand that at all. Mm. And I may, Sebi may not recall this, but I do. And I said, well, how do you do that? Like, well, I think we all go around with a lot of bravado. I'm yeah. this, I'm that. Abandon all that shit. Learn, learn everything you can by asking questions. Don't be afraid to be foolish. If you want to give yourself a little psychological out, sometimes I use the phrase now, this may sound kind of stupid. <laughs> and then you ask the question, but do it. And again, what happens in the upper sphere of any particular field is all the experts are so used to the shorthand that sometimes they're not even open to a new way of thinking about it, which the jury will need, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So again, young lawyers out there in particular, if you're going to experts, break it right down. And you might come up with interesting ideas that even your bosses and the, the fancy trial lawyers mm -hmm will like and, and that will help with the yeah, and when you're working with your experts do everything on the phone because anything in writing or email is discoverable yeah right <laughs> exactly um so let's talk about one of the big issues here is the the drug use the yeah. methamphetamine the meth that was in the system of your motorcycle it was meth right it was methamphetamine it was marijuana and and a partridge in a pear tree but it was yes here's the thing about drugs and finding them in people who are deceased just because drugs happen to exist inside of a person doesn't necessarily mean they contributed to the accident. Exactly. Right? So there's, that the sub, there's negligence and substantial, substantial factor. Right. Factor. Now, we really, I mean, I'm telling you what, one of the finest depositions I've ever seen was Arash taking session one of their toxicologist. Who did they use? Some, oh, gee, Bob, you always show how bad I am at names. Uh, uh, her was name it Vina is Schweiler? No, no, I I deposed her. Oh, I, yeah, I, I proper that. gave her a I yeah. gave her a hiding. She ran. Yeah. I get I'm yeah. not blowing my own horn, but I took a depot of that of her for uh, our second case, Rubble Cala, and I gave her a bloody hiding. She eventually will tell you that she can't yeah, predict. She yeah. I mean, with these toxicologists, like practice point, when you guys are taking the deposition of the defense expert, they will tell you the look, I can only tell you how how many drinks they had in their system or what was in their system, but I can't tell you if they were impaired. Yes, right. And that's the critical question. That's a substantial factor. To a reasonable degree of toxicologist probability, yeah. was there impairment? Yeah. Did you say this caused or contributed to this whatsoever specifically for this person? Yeah. So there's a thing no? that, there's a, cut into the chase, there's a thing they use, which is, uh, I think it's Barry Logan was a guy who was a toxicologist who wrote, the, wrote this kind of seminal paper on this. Mm -hmm. And it's layers and layers. It's very London? Barry uh, Logan. Logan. I think it's Logan. If I'm wrong, some smarty aleck out there will correct us, but it's Barry Logan. And he has a graph that is often used by these defense toxicologists. And it works like this on methamphetamine in particular. You see a graph dip down and you see different effects written on the graph as you have a higher concentration of meth or amphetamine in the system. And you'll have written things like beside like agitation, mm -hmm. loss of motor control, paranoia, but there's no relationship to those statements to causality in terms Correct. of the, the percentage chance of that happening. So a lot of people who take these depots, they take they down the primrose path with these bloody toxicologists and let the toxicologists get away with saying all this shit. So what we do, and Amanpour really laid this into me and all of his excellent team over there, 
we go after every bit of underlying uh, article or literature. Mm -hmm. And they all basically are either incomplete control groups, mm -hmm. they don't create a probability relationship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to figure out the sample you size, keep get going, all the data, keep going. exactly. And all Spieler and the likes of them, they all know this, but they try to get away with it, and they, they'll really scrap you until they quit. And then when they quit, you start to get the concessions and the quotes that become your motions and limits. Correct, Now, Correct. we really did enough on the first one, Andrade, to, I think, to have all excluded. There was even chain of custody issues. Was, well, but I mean, you're, yeah. and here's the realistic, though. You do everything right. You do everything perfect. There's no way it should come to evidence. And, then and it comes get, in. And then it comes in. Because yeah. you have yeah. judges like you had in your trial that want you to lose. And yeah. you, have to be, you have to be able to deal with that. Yeah. And when you're trying your cases and doing focus groups ahead of that, you have to let these bad evidence come in. Because yeah. you can't assume that, well, it, it's out. Yeah. Um, well, talk to us about the one thing that a lot of lawyers miss is the foundation stuff. Yes. The toxicologist, the stuff at the hospital. Walk us through how you you, you dealt with that so, issue. Because you, you do, I've had trials where we kept it out. Yeah. You gotta be prepared to keep it in, but there's ways to keep it out if you do it right. Yeah, so I'm trying to remember every, th th we went out, we attacked every front of this, but aspect one is the chain of custody of the mm -hmm. sample. And what happened was our uh, our expert looked at it and said, look, I, on paper it looks right, but we, we, you can put them up to it. You can force them to start calling people and doing that. Typically, the, it is certainly in places like LA, the, those offices and the coroner's offices are getting better and better at dealing with that. But that's that's phase one. Is the like like old school? Like where did this sample go? Could it be contaminated? What what bottle was it put in? How was it handled? Etc. 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 How was it calibrated? Along if you see that hospital record, sometimes it'll put at the bottom. It'll say not to be used for legal proceedings. Right. They didn't run a control. They didn't run it again. They didn't run it a second time. Right. And that's a lot of times foundationally you can get it out. Now that wasn't our issue with this one. What happened? What ended up happening to kind of cut through some of the look? I'm by the but way, but it came in in his trial. It, it came bloody in. well came in yeah. and one. One of the issues we had was it came to a finite point where there was law that says if someone basically just records an automated result, that's not that cannot be that that is not necessarily hearsay in a certain situation. But we had found out uh, through the course of examination that one of the people in the office actually had to do a simple piece of math to convert the result mm. into the end printed result. And we thought we had the law rock solid on this. Again, Barnstein was really up against, we were up against on every level. And he ultimately said, no, no, that math is so simple that it, uh, we made the argument like, what's the difference if it's 10,000 calculations versus one? It's the human element that changes yeah, it. The one calculation. Not. And that was another thing that Barnstein kind of fucked us over on. But anyway, the bottom line is it came in. But I will say this for anyone listening, if you have a case where people you have a decedent or, or even people still living, if they have these issues, if these issues are in your case, we have all the motions in limine, we have all the depot transfers, Bob, I'm sure as well. So don't go into that not knowing how we've classically destroyed these people. Come at us and we give you the info we share because we're a good community of, of commies over here in the plaintiff's bar. Anyway, so it came in. And then what you do is once it comes, once the judge goes, right, Matt's coming in, you're obviously going to cover it in your mini opening yep. and you're going to devour it in your voir dire and you're yep. going to spend time on it. And you're going to ask people about the prejudices that emerge by just the thought of someone having used certain drugs. Did you, so how many, well, again, you're yeah. not having a good judge, but were you able to get jurors off just for cause, which means the judge is just striking it because they can't be fair no matter what? He, it was, I tell you what, that's a funny one. So Arash did the, the, the jury selection and uh, he did the voir dire. He's brilliant. And he's very, very, he really hunts for the, for the, for the fine answer. And he said, right, Ron, you go do the cause challenges. Oh my God. <laughs> so we went back into barn scenes and Arash had not seen me do submissions up to that point and it went quite well. And he came on, he said, yeah, you, you're all right. You can speak. <laughs> uh, you're not doing it again, but you know, no. anyway, so uh, we, the, even on that level where we were, we had people slam dunk on cause. He was not, he was not kicking That's crazy. Out. Like it was crazy town. But, but anyway, so you cover all of that. You talk about prejudice. I think Arash, what he had said to a lot of the jurors was like, you know, kind of, I don't know if he said it as an, as inartfully as I'm about to, but he said something like everyone's on something like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was one of those things. But we luckily got a panel that could divorce that psychologically. So you know, TLDR here, verdict amount for wrongful death for the deceased. What was it? What was the amount? It was 36 million. 36 with a nice bit of 99A okay. flying on the end of that too. So 36 million, they probably owed 50. 
at yeah. the end. Okay. 50 million judgment at the end. How much negligence or comparative did they put on the decedent on meth that they say was speeding? How many? How much? Zero. Zero. So he had a person on meth. Jury said 0% at fault. Yes. And they gave 36 million. Yeah, and I'll tell you how. Even with yeah. all these challenges. Even with all the challenges. Yeah, look at that. I no, mean, I kind of so, got, so, got little goosebumps. No, <laughs> I tell you what. <laughs> if you like that, you ain't seen nothing yet, Bob. No, I tell you, what happened with that was when the meth comes in, what you then do is destruction. Um, you do a destruction of their experts on the issue of impairment. None of them are going to say there was any evidence of impairment, where in this case, a man was driving reasonably straight on a road and we were proving that he wasn't speeding. And you prove that even if he had nothing in his system, nobody could have avoided this crash. Exactly. And there's, do you know what, on a, it's very interesting because I, I spent a ton of time reading about all this. And there's even studies, now this didn't come in and we, we played around with it, but the studies that certain like fighter pilots had been given doses of methamphetamine to test their reactions. Because you may or better. may not know that, like, right? And they, they perform better. They perform better. I've seen those studies. Do you know what's crazy? I only found this out not long ago. I was watching this wonderful documentary on Netflix. Do you know, like when, when, the, when the bloody Nazis were Oh, yeah, they're all methamphetamines. Yeah, they're all, yeah. Methed out all methamphetamines. Yeah, I read it. I mean, I used to read a lot of books and like so, World War II books, and they were all. Public safety announcement. Myself and Mr. Simon are not advocating for the use of methamphetamine in, Never. The, in, the, Never. in the use of mm. complex equipment. But in any event, it's kind of a bunch of nonsense, right? So unless there was actual evidence of uh, of impairment, impairment. funny That's driving, weird behavior. Impairment, impairment, impairment. Impairment is the you key. You put in every single one of your depositions from foundation, from experts to your expert to their experts. Can you say impairment to a reasonable degree yeah. of medical probability? No. They'll Why? all say no. Exactly. And that's the thing where like you have, I mean, anybody out there that's listening, I mean, if you, if anyone drinks alcohol, you know, people that can finish a whole bottle of bourbon. You know, some people that are, can't have one drink yeah. and act the same. It, right? it, it's all about, if you don't have evidence, that's a key issue. Actually, if you don't have evidence of tolerance. Yes. You do not, you do not get to say how it affects them. You might have seen. I posted a video. I was taking some depot with some. He was a neurologist. And was he, it Barry Ludwig? Not Barry London. No, was it Barry Ludwig? No, this is, no, this is a <laughs> different geezer. I put it on Instagram, but he basically said that he, he said a certain level of alcohol, and he said anyone at that level. Of oh, point two or some shit. Was that Daryl Clardy? He's a guy that does that. Oh, oh man, he this keeps exposing my lack of understanding and remembrance of names, <laughs> but. What happened was, I said to him, sir, you have obviously never been to Ireland. <laughs> you would realize how ridiculous no. that statement is. But the, that's the... It, it's it, crazy. It's a facetious point. So, like, I had but, one toxicologist, and he, for the defense, and he said, if you have four drinks in an hour, you don't, like, you, you don't have control of your body, you're tripping over yourself. He had all this analysis, and I was like... And the, the person that ended up getting catastrophic injured was like the same size as I was. So the, during that deposition, I had four drinks of bourbon. I sat there, I drank four drinks of bourbon. And I was like, sir, would you be, I mean, according to you, I wouldn't be able to function if I had four drinks in the last yeah. hour. He's like, no, no, no. I was like, I just drank four, like yeah. four bourbons. And like, I'm taking your deposition on a penalty perjury. I'm like, yeah, notify my, my malpractice carrier, maybe. But. Well, it's like bloody Andre the Giant. That dude would have put away 120 pounds. I know, pounds. it's crazy. Tolerance being what it is. What was another thing? So we, tolerance impairment okay, right. foundation and at the end of the day yeah this jury at the end they they heard all this shit yeah right. and they still said you're there's nothing you're even if you say what's true not so did the jury say that he was negligent yeah so here's oh, okay. here's, yeah, here's the key yeah. feature and this tells you how you have to sometimes watch carefully how you do your verdict form one of the questions was was he negligent and remember they're, they're reading it sequentially and we're like sitting there oh, here we go and the answer was yes. I'm like, oh, here we go. Here comes yep. the percent. And they said no. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, Jesus. Well, I mean, it was such a profound moment because we're like, oh, we, this is going to be a, a real result here. Um, from speaking to the jurors after which, afterwards, which everyone should do, and I'll talk yep. to you about that in a minute. Young lawyers, we go out with fancy trial lawyers and do this. You go out with a bloody clipboard and you get all their details. Do mm -hmm. not let those people leave without without getting contact details because that's we, that's another day's work to talk about how you protect. And that's where you have other people in your office. A lot of time, the yeah. lawyer has to stay in the courtroom with the judge while they release the jury. You have somebody out in the hallway. Where you get you a crew folks. down there. Yep. Don't don't. You're sitting there going, you yeah, know, I'm the champion of the world, and then the appeals coming all out. Anyway, so what happened was they had said we think he was negligent because he had meth in his system. But he, it, he wasn't negligent in the operation of the vehicle. So that's, that's what was zero. Yep. And that was a big thing. And I, I don't want to, there's stuff going on with the appeal that I won't comment on. But that was, they totally got it. 
In fact, one juror said something. He's like, yeah, I think there was some testimony that he'd been at, this guy had been at a party a few days before. And, and sometimes, okay, on the documents from the toxicology report, there was a little mention of ecstasy on it, on the report. Mm. And the slippery fuckers managed to get that in. And oh, God. We, we, anyway, it was a moment where it was a flashed on screen and taken off. But one of the very clever jurors had spotted him. He goes, I bet he was out and he probably took E or something. And a Damn. lot of them are co-mixed with very, like, it was, it was really interesting to see how a juror was tackling oh. the potential ins and outs of what that so means. So the juror was probably, at that point, probably rooting for you and figuring out, like, come on, he could right. have, he could have it, inadvertently had meth in his system due to some sort of accident or some party he went to. And meth's one of those ones that, it, you can have false positives and it can be days before, right? Day, well, it, it metabolizes. You can tell, you can kind of time it because it metabolizes to amphetamine and that takes a period of time. If you have a case and the tox report says pure meth and methamphetamine, that means they took it recently. But in this case, there was some evidence of amphetamine metabolization as it breaks down. Mm. I, another thing, very quickly, Bob, and I know we're running on time here. One of the issues was in the final stages of discovery, I really needed to get to terms with, did anyone talk to him before he got on the bike to actually tell us how impaired or, or not he was? And from a little bit of a last minute scramble, sure enough, we found a roommate that had spoken to him that morning. In those moments, you don't panic. You immediately correct whatever list you need to correct. You immediately offer them for oh, a position. Yeah. You don't want them to be and taken you, up. And you just make it an idiot. What you can have, you just make it, make them look like complete pricks if they say no to it. Mm -hmm. I'll and, offer this person for deposition yeah. at our cost. Anytime you're, yeah. you want, yeah. weekends don't matter. Blah, exactly. Blah. Yep. So that was another thing in this case. We had evidence from a person who, who saw him just before he got on the bike. And she said he was completely fine. He was like, totally normal. Now, he may well have been in there taking that, but again, tolerance or yeah. whatever it was, it wasn't affecting him that way. There was other analysis that was going on. We thought he was a guy who was on a, on a fitness journey. Jeez, I hate using the word journey, Bob. Jesus. He was on a fitness journey, and he, they thought maybe some of the supplements, used, like they used to sell this shit called Jack 3D, which was a pre-workout powder. I fucking oh, you, you, you'd, you'd be jacked up on There's that. There's fucking meth in that. So really? we, we analyzed that kind of stuff as well. But all in all, it ended up coming in. We had done our work to get an intelligent, compassionate jury. Where it got so bad, I'll tell you this last anecdote on this, or unless you want to carry on, I could talk for days. I know, we, that's why I said we should just do a show about talking about yeah. these. Yeah, yeah. but good. in their closing, Arash did this blistering closing, one of the best I've seen. And then they get up and she said something like, the, the, the trial attorney, she's a nice lady, but this was obviously a nervous mistake, so it can happen, but you obviously have to exploit this like a fucker. She got up and said, life goes on. That was the first Ooh. line. Life goes on. Not for your client. And we're all sitting there. Oh, <laughs> boy. And Arash gets up. And he didn't over. He didn't overcut it. He said, it doesn't go on. Like, you know, so you just stay open, stay loose. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you a true story. When I was a young barrister, uh, I heard a story about an old prime minister of ours called Bertie Ahern. Only in Ireland could you have a chief executive <laughs> called Bertie Ahern. And he used to be a nervous. You know, speaker. you know, it's funny. I can, I'm already visualizing when we transcribe this episode how much trouble they're going to have, <laughs> like at the end. With English, you. do you not speak in Americans? <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's going to be like a deposition when the court you, reporter asks you for some spellings at the end. In of trial, it. they're telling me to slow down. I'm going really slow, but that extra little click of an accent yeah. makes it sound like I'm going fast. I am going fast now because I had a lot of coffee and meth. Yeah. <laughs> but what happened was the pre-workout meth. What happened was. Bertie Ahern, this old prime minister, was a very nervous speaker, a bit of a stutterer. And he said, and I've used this, and I invite anyone out there to use it, as silly as it may seem. He goes, when you're nervous before you speak, you picture butterflies, because we have butterflies in our belly, that light feeling when you're dying, you're not speaking from your power, you're speaking up somewhere here. He goes, picture the butterflies and then force them to fly in formation. And it's a little weird psychological thing I do. When you get up to the lectern, you look and you're like, eh. Common pores over here, jurors over here, CVN's fucking filming down here. Butterflies, butterflies. Push them into formation, Roland. And really? you get into formation. So um, that trial in LA was not televised, but the, another one in San Bernardino was on CVN. Is no, that correct? No, it Which wasn't. Andrade was televised for openings and closings. Oh, gotcha. So if you want to see the openings and closings, and I highly recommend it, particularly the rebuttal was just state of the art like that's awesome. avant-garde so like yeah. we're pretty much out of time here but i just want to tldr some of these the, the really bad facts that led to eight and nine figure verdicts we talked about in la on meth they say speeding 
zero percent at fault for the motorcycle rider, thirty six million oh fifty. You have another one in San Bernardino. Is yeah, no, that was one. Where it was a really, really fascinating case. Well, um, what did, we'll yeah. just do the TLDR. What was the verdict? The verdict on the second one was thirty four million and change. Thirty four million, and what was the on meth? On meth. Uh, he might have been on other stuff. No, he was definitely, it was Matt there, yeah. Who was your, was that McCarville? Was that your judge at that one? McCarville. He's right. the best. So the, by the, the, He retired. Though, he retired. So by the time we air this, McCarville will retire. He's nicknamed the sheriff in San Bernardino. Oh. And San Bernardino has probably the best bun, bench of judges, but now the older guard who are just fantastic on evidence, very fair what they do. McCarville is one of the best are in retirement ages. Oh, and I hope he, to see him retire. He was the best. He was, I, uh, I walked in, I didn't tell you this, but I go to trial with a bag of relics, like a monk in the 12th century. What is I, your problem? I have bits of the real cross. I have the a Padre Peel piece of cloth. I have my wig. I come in with the whole nine yards. You say wig or weed? Wig. Guy, I know. Wig. That's wig, Bob. <laughs> it's a barrister wig. Anyway, so McCarroll, I sell my, my bag of tricks my relics on the table, which Arash is now really into. You might deny it. But uh, <laughs> McCarville's like looking down and going, uh, what's, all, what's all that, counsel? And I was like, ah, oh, this is from Ireland. That's from Tipperary. This is from Wexford. And this is my barrister. Now you guys are best friends. And he's like, well, I'm McCarville. And here's my shillelagh. Like he, it's a, it's a, it's a, we had a relic off. Oh my we God, had a, awesome. a tchotchke off. He's pulling out the uh, shillelaghs and all this kind of carry on. And in that trial, Arash let me take two of the plaintiffs in, in ex examination in chief. And I was getting away with bloody murder. Yeah. Like, I, I was leading as, as leading can be. But the McCarr was like, oh, the old country shines. And that's through. where I like um, he's McCarville. a great, but, he, but, but he's a great judge. Yeah, I had a, a my trial I had in front of him on CBN televised as well. And that foundation thing we talked about, the defense lawyer would like to object about every single thing. And there was obvious it was going to come in. He kept objecting to foundation. The judge is like... Look at him, he's like, you want to make that objection again, counsel? He's like, I will, I will sustain it, but I'm just letting you know. Are you going to do it again? He does it, and the, the jury's just like, come on, guy. Yeah. Like, come on, guy. Um, so, Ronan Dugan, how do people find you, first of all? You go out into the street, and you yell, is there an AI out there? Is there actual Irish in L.A.? <laughs> and I'll show up like Batman. No, you'll find me by, I'm at the Hominpore Law Firm. Uh, you can contact me there via my email, which is on the website. I have an Instagram, but it's private because that's where I unleash my most scoundrelly bullshit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, uh, yeah, just get me via email and I'll contact you whatever way you want to be contacted. Yeah, and, and if you want to talk, Ron and I talk deep dive about um, gaming, RPGs, the real fun stuff in life. Yeah. So if you want to talk, you know, he played a very, very articulate and fun uh, barbarian in our campaign and I was a mechanic from the future masquerading and, yeah. help, and helping the robots the autonomous in that yeah. campaign and it was best year and a half of my life I tell you what it was and that barbarian would have got me cancelled pretty quick what do you reckon? <laughs> yes he would have and that's when the but it's called play acting. It's called uh, living the Daniel Day Lewis improv kind of method shite. Yep. And it's that type of stuff that makes that some people go to the Trial Lawyers College of Wyoming. Some people play um, D and D type campaigns with their friends to learn how to role play. Because our lives are dope, and we do dope, we do shit. dope shit. Ronan, thank you for coming on. Visit JusticeTeamNetwork.com to find this episode. If you have any questions about meth gaming, eight and nine figure verdicts, reach out to this human being. The and Justice it, Team Network. And here's Brandon with the weather. <laughs> shite, shite, shite.